Uh, okay, so welcome again to the Miracle Pointer and Starscan presentation. Uh, my name is Lukas, and together with Bartek, uh, I will talk today about use after free bugs and how we hope to prevent them from being exploitable in most cases. So this is this is this is the plan for for the presentation. Uh, I'm gonna start by first outlining why we think use after free bugs are important. And for that, uh, I need to quickly recap the Chromium's security architecture. Uh, so as with most modern browsers, uh, the web content in Chromium gets rendered, gets hosted in a separate process, right? And this process is sandboxed so that even if an attacker manages to find the bug in Blink or V8 and manages to compromise the render process, uh, manages to get an ability to execute uh, arbitrary native code in the in the render process, uh, they're still kind of jailed or caged inside the, inside the render process uh, without being able to directly access uh, further sensitive resources. Uh, so for example, the, the, the sandbox means that the render cannot directly access cookies, uh, cannot uh, access local files on the user's machine, cannot start arbitrary network requests potentially by passing same state cookies or cars, things like that, uh, right? And then uh, for like, obviously we, we still care about uh, bugs that allow an attacker to compromise their entire process. Uh, such bugs are still going to be marked as high severity uh, and they're going to be urgently fixed and if needed, merged to the stable channel. Uh, but in practice, given the big attack surface of the render, we need to take a defense in depth approach, uh, be pragmatic and, and the sandbox and site isolation is gonna is, is giving us extra assurance that uh, an attacker won't be able to do more harm uh, if they manage to compromise their their process. Uh, but this assurance uh, very much depends uh, on the strength of the sandbox. Uh, so if an attacker, uh manages to trick the operating system uh in into escaping the sandbox so, so uh trying to exit execute a malform sys api call or something like that uh then they can escape the sandbox right and here we depend on collaboration with uh, operating system authors to, to to strengthen the sandbox give, give us the primitives uh that we need to do that uh and the, the, the other escape route that an attacker can take to, to escape the sandbox is going through the browser process. Uh, and in particular, in this presentation, we're gonna talk about the use after free bugs that might be present in the browser process and that an, an attacker might try to exploit to escape the sandbox. Uh, so as you see on the picture, there are uh, multiple processes involved here. The attacker is in a separate process from, 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 from the process where the use after free bugs happens. But, but even so, uh, it is still possible for an attacker uh, to escape the sandbox. I, I, I have an, uh, a, a link to an example from Project Zero where a particular use, the, use after free is described in, in, in more detail. And in general, uh, we assume that all use after free bugs uh, that we discovered that they might be exploitable. And rather than second guessing our, ourselves, uh, spending time on uh further analysis we assume that, that the bug can be exploited and we have to urgently fix the bug like risk the merge the stable channel uh so from that perspective preventing uh, the bug from being exploitable would give us a little bit more time a little bit more, uh, more of peace of mind uh so you might be wondering how how many of uh, the use after free bugs uh happen in, in practice uh, it turns out that there are quite a few. Uh, looking at the past security bugs, uh, we see that roughly half of the security bugs are used after free, and that, that result is the same when we look uh, overall, or it, if we focus on just the browser process. Uh, and similarly, if we look at how attackers try to attack from in the wild, uh, use after free bugs also represent a significant chunk uh, of those attempts. Uh, so with this background uh, out of the way, uh, let us now talk about how we plan to prevent exploitation of use after free bugs. And with that, let me uh, 
uh, let me transition over to Bartek. Hello, everyone. Uh, so we've got two projects uh, here to save the day. One is Miracle Pointer, uh, developed in Tokyo, and one is Tarscan, developed in the Munich office. And uh, let me start by uh, telling what the projects are about, what the goal is. Uh, so we are not really interested in detecting use after freeze because we already have tools for that. That's one. And second thing, once we realize we have a use after free, like Lucas said, we still have to like fix it right away and rush it to the stable channel, which is something we don't want to. We, will, we would sleep much better if we have technologies that, that allow us uh, to make these, this use after freeze not exploitable at all. And we really want, we, we really want them to be deterministic. Furthermore, more, we want these to target all platforms. So for example, if there's any platform that for whatever reason we cannot target, so what that we can protect all the other platforms, but if we find a UAF, we still have to rush it to rush the fix to the, uh, to the stable channel, just to make sure that this last platform is not vulnerable. Uh, so we definitely want to cover everything. Uh, well, in terms of width of the uh, available platforms. Uh, however, for now, we're going to limit the scope to the browser process. And the reason is simple, uh, because the browser process is more security sensitive uh, and less performance sensitive. In contrast, uh, the renderer process is, uh, is more performance sensitive. And unfortunately, both Miracle Pointer and Starscan have a performance tax. Uh, currently making uh, uh, making it somewhat prohibitive in the render process. Uh, now, I'm not saying that it's not going to happen. It just, we're for now, we're focusing on the browser and we'll tackle the render after. Now, last but not least, uh, there is an important dependency for both of us projects. It's called Partition Unlock Everywhere. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit more later. Next slide, please. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of an attacker and see how a use after free can be exploited. So let's say the attacker knows about UAF in the code. So first of all, they have to conjure a dangling pointer. So let's say we've got a pointer pointing to an object A. That object A gets, gets freed, the pointer stays, and somebody else, or well, probably the attacker, uh, does something to make the uh, make the uh, to make the mo the same memory be allocated for another object with the attacker's data, and whenever we uh, we dereference the object A again, we'll actually be accessing the data that is provided by the by the attacker. Now, for example, if the if the hacker managed to override the virtual table pointer. This may lead to, to them being able to jump to any place in memory they, that they want. So how can we disrupt this attack flow? At first, we were considering algorithms that, uh, uh, that, uh, that target the, uh, the dereference. And we had, some, uh, we had a couple ideas where uh, the allocator would provide a tag for each allocation. And the pointer to those allocations would be decorated with that with that same tag in the top in the top 16 bits. So every time we dereference the memory, we compare the tags. If they're fine, if they're equal, everything is fine. However, if the memory gets freed and reallocated, it will get a different tag. And on dereference, we will see that they're different and and crash the process. Now that work. That worked mostly well, except that once in a while, the tag may repeat randomly. Uh, and even if we use 16 bits for a tag, which is probability 1 in 65,000, that's still not good enough uh, because, uh, for example, uh, Spectre uh, can defeat that, uh, that kind of protection. So we shifted our focus to, uh, to freeing the memory. Uh, effect effectively, we postponed the free until later. If there is no free, there is no use after free. So 
So uh, by postponing it until we have a guarantee that there is no dangling pointer, uh, we take away the tools from the attacker. Next slide, please. Uh, let me start uh, diving into details of the technologies we're, we've been implementing. Uh, so first of all, we've got partition analog everywhere. Like I said, it's a dependency for both Miracle Pointer and Star Scan. A partition alloc is a Chrome's own allocator. And both of those technologies need the support from our allocator to be able to work properly and provide the protection. Uh, currently, partition alloc is used only in the blink, which is not good enough. We want it to be used everywhere. But we don't want to spend time to change every single allocation in the code to move it to partition alloc. The route we're taking is to intercept the malloc calls and uh, satisfy those requests via partition alloc. Next slide, please. Uh, Starscan is the is a family of the of the algorithms that uh, share one thing in common. You guessed it right. It's a scan of memory. And uh, First of all, I want to mention that uh, the algorithms, these algorithms are fully transparent to, uh, to the common developers and fully contained within partition alloc. Uh, first algorithm that I want to talk about is called P PC scan, which stands for probabilistic and conservative scan. It works like that. Uh, Whenever partition alloc is asked to free memory, it actually doesn't do that right away. It quarantines the memory instead and also poisons it in hope that whenever somebody accesses that memory later, uh, while they, when they shouldn't, uh, they will read trash and crash. Uh, we'll be notified about it uh, through the crash reporting system and uh, we'll know about UAF. Uh, however, I do have to point out that it is not the crash that is the necessary component of, of the uh, behind the protection. It is the quarantine that is necessary here. Uh, and the memory is quarantined until a scan, a full memory scan uh, runs and confirms that there is no dangling pointers pointing to that memory. If we can confirm that, then the memory can be released and will be available for future reallocations. Now, let me demystify the terms probabilistic and uh, conservative in the, in the name of algorithm. So let's start with the conservative. We want to be on the safe side and therefore we'll treat all the data as a, as a potential pointer. This may lead to, the, to false positives, thus leaking memory, but but that hopefully should be rare. Now, what does probabilistic mean? Um, in this particular case, probabilistic mean, means that it's, well, it's not 100% guaranteed that we'll keep the point, the, the memory, uh, the allocations in memory, um, because if the dangling pointers are uh, being written while the scan is in progress, the scan may miss those pointers and release the memory while, while it shouldn't. Now, in order for the attacker to be able to exploit this, we will need to uh, time a, a, into a race condition, which might be very difficult. Whether, whether it's good enough of a protection, like the jury, the jury is still out on this one, uh, but that's actually the reason why another algorithm called DC scan is on the table. It works exactly just like PC scan, but it uses write protection and page fault handler to achieve the determinism. Next slide, please. Uh, on the in the other corner, we've got Miracle Pointer, which is also a family of algorithms uh, that have a, a different thing in common, and namely, uh, it is the a wrapper class for, for all the pointers. Now, we're not gonna change all the pointers ourselves manually. We've got the rewriter tool that, uh, that rewrites not all, but almost all uh, row pointers, T star into miracle pointer of T. 
Now, what is Miracle Pointer of T? Uh, from the API point of view, it looks very much like uh, smart pointers that you're used to, for example, unique PTR. Now, underneath the covers, the implementation is different. Uh, it works very closely with partition alloc to diffuse the UAF. Now, the implementation depends on which algorithm we choose. And we have we consider quite a few different algorithms. I put a link at the bottom of the slide uh, for you to, to take a look. There are almost 10 of them. However, we narrow down to one algorithm that is most promising. Next slide, please. It's called Backup Brief PTR. Conceptually, it's a fairly simple algorithm. Uh, for every allocation, there is a, a partition alloc provides a, a reference count. And every time we have a miracle pointer uh, pointing to that, uh, to that memory, the refer reference count goes up by one. Every time miracle pointer goes away, the refer reference count goes, goes down by one. Now, when we attempt to free the memory and the reference count is still greater than zero, then we do pretty much the same what I described just for, for a PC scan. We quarantine and poison that memory. However, the difference is that we don't rely on a scan to release the memory. Uh, in fact, the responsibility for releasing the memory will fall on the destructor of the last miracle pointer pointing to that memory. Next slide, please. All right, let's talk about what we've got so far. So we've got the rewriter, we've got a partition log everywhere, we've got a handful of uh, miracle pointer implementations. Most of them we rejected and and this uh, narrowed down to backup breath PTR. We've got PC scan and DC scan will, will be on the way soon. Now we also have some initial performance results. So backup breath PTR. Uh, for backup breath PTR, the binary size increases by 3%. Uh, the browse, browser process memory usage increases by also uh, 3%. The browser startup increases by 2%. Uh, that's 21 milliseconds. I hope you can live with that. Now, speedometer gets worse a little bit as well. Uh, now, here's a catch. Uh, speedometer is a benchmark that tests mostly render. And I said, before that we are not focusing on the renderer, we just want to protect the browser process. That is true. However, due to the nature of the of the miracle pointer wrapper, uh, we cannot eliminate the overhead in the renderer because of the libraries that are shared between all all the processes. So we're we're still paying a penalty. Uh, penalty in the renderer, despite the renderer not being protected. The good news is that uh, in the speedometer on average doesn't regress, only it's the speedometer sub benchmarks. Uh, some of them regress in the worst case up to one and a half percent. On the bright side, partition alloc everywhere is now being tested in a dev channel and in the browser, in the 99th percentile, the private memory footprint improved by 19% and junkiness improved by 13.5%. This is huge. Disclaimer, these are all initial results. So that they may change in every direction. Let's not open the champagne yet, uh, but we're very hopeful. Next slide, please. Uh, let's talk about the future. So first of all, we have to finish shipping partition log everywhere. It's coming to the browser, browsers near you in M99. Because Cross your fingers. Around the same time, we'll be uh, investing in heavily testing backup RFPTR and DC scan in the real world, first in a dev channel and eventually in a stable channel. Uh, by the way, I should mention that for now, we're focusing on Windows and, and 32 bit Android. Um, somewhere in Q2, We'll collect all the numbers, all the results that we got, and we'll have to make a decision whether to ship DC scan or whether to land the big rewrite and ship backup FPTR with it. Uh, like I said many slides ago, we have we have to cover all platforms. So that will be uh, uh, that's something we'll be working on after 
after Q2. All right, next slide, please. Lastly, I want to uh, highlight the difference highlight the differences between backup RFPTR and DC scan. Uh, so backup, backup RFPTR has some shortcomings. First of all, it needs the big rewrite. DC scan doesn't need that. W big rewrite means it, uh, the build time is going to increase a little bit, the binary size is going to increase a little bit, and the Chromium developers will have the uh, uh, harder time deciding which kind of smart pointer or, or maybe raw pointer to use. Also, backup ref PTR, uh, PTR has another shortcoming that it doesn't cover all the pointers, uh, unlike the DC scan. Uh, fortunately, the difference is small; only a, a small percent, only a few percent of the pointers are not are not covered. There are also a few unknowns, but we'll going to try to figure out in the next few months. Uh, for example, can a conservative scan, does conservative scan work well on 32-bit platforms? Uh, we don't know that. Uh, the problem with 32-bit is that data has higher probability to look like a pointer, hence more potential false positives and memory leaks. Uh, we also don't know what is going to be overhead of either of those uh, technologies uh, in the real world. So we'll have to test it. Uh, we don't know the impact of the stack scanning. So far, everything we've been, I've been talking about is related to, is uh, tied to the protection of the pointers on the heap. We haven't, we haven't seen how protection of the pointers on stack is going to look like. So we'll have to evaluate that as well. Uh, next thing we don't know about is uh, DC scan. Uh, how well, how feasible it is to use the page fault handler? We don't know that. Uh, for backup of PTR, we don't know how uh, how much effort is going to take uh, to um, to protect the remaining few percent of the pointers. And maybe there will be some pointers that we will not be able to cover at all. All right, uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your attention. Now I'm going to ha hand back to Wukash, uh, who will summarize the presentation. Uh, thank you. So let me first start by uh, giving some numbers of how many years after free bugs we hope to prevent from being exploitable with, with the techniques that Bartek just described. Uh, so this is based on the data from three uh, releases of Chrome. Uh, we found some use after free bugs uh, in those. Uh, ones that were, like we, we looked on it, those that were found and fixed in the stable channel. And then 18 of those bugs were in the browser process. So it's a small sample size, but at the same time, it, it's uh, the, the best quantitative data that, that we have so far. And even if uh, we cover just the raw pointers stored in fields, so just uh, backup ref PTR, we will still be able to prevent roughly half of use after free bugs from being exploitable. Uh, if we add stack scanning to that, that percentage goes up to 83%. And as Bartek said, the delta to DC scan is surprisingly surprisingly small. Uh, so backup ref PTR doesn't cover uh, third parties, which we wouldn't be able to rewrite. It doesn't cover C only code where no templates can be used. Uh, initially, we wouldn't rewrite raw pointers in containers, but still. Uh, based on those three milestones of data, the delta was just 6%. Uh, and then to wrap up, I, I want to like share a broader perspective of uh, how the memory unsafety of C++ is a tax that we have to pay uh, one way or another. Like that tax might be something that's not immediately visible in day-to-day -day work. We might have gotten used to some of that tax, but it does exist, right? Uh, we, we, we pay the tax through security vulnerabilities, uh, through the cost of resources we invest into like, huge fuzzing farms, uh, and, and through engineering costs, like fire drills for urgent fixing of, of, of bugs and, 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 and addressing stability problems, right? Uh, so there's really no free lunch. Uh, we hope to get the performance of backup PR and CSCAN as good as possible. Our goal is obviously to, to, to ship with no performance regressions, uh, but at the same time, there, there, there really is no free lunch, no silver bullet. Uh, 
we have to pay for, for the memory and safety one way or the other. And obviously we would prefer to pay with small, as small as possible performance costs and some engineering costs rather than with, uh, pay, with, with, with having security vulnerabilities. Uh, and lastly, uh, I wanted to really thank uh, everyone who was involved in the project. That project has spun uh, multiple sites, multiple time zones. And I think it's great how we, could, how we were able to come together and brainstorm various solutions together, built on top of one uh, another's ideas and, and end up where, where, where we are today. Uh, and with that, let me open the floor to questions. Uh, we're almost over time, but this is the last session uh, for today. So hopefully we can stay here a little bit longer uh, if needed. Uh, so there's a question uh, on detection versus uh, preventing exploitation angle. Uh, so like by scoping down the uh, the project, we were hoping to be able to uh, have more flexibility with regards to like optimizing performance and, and approaches that we can take. And there are some other uh, techniques that we employ to detect use after freeze. So we ship GWP ASAN to, uh, to some of our users and then uh, get reports from the wild that way. Uh, there are other ways, I guess, like fuzzing, although that's not directly applicable. But the point is that uh, for all the use after freeze that we don't know about, we still want to protect the user, right? So so this project focuses on the on the use after freeze that we don't know about, that we might never learn about because the attacker uh, tries to exploit some kind of a corner case. Uh, I don't know if that answered the question. Uh, just to add to that, uh, uh, ARM is also working on a MTE, uh, which is hardware support for, uh, for detecting use after freeze. Uh, and also I want to reiterate what I, what I mentioned earlier is that uh, even if we're aware of use after free, but but we don't have a technology that disarms uh, or diffuses use after free and makes it not exploitable, we'll have to rush to fix them uh, right away and, and deliver the fix to the stable channel. Now, if we have something that effectively prevents the hacker from, from using use after free, we will we'll have some more time. Uh, and we'll, we won't have to move heaven and earth to uh, to make it happen for, by yesterday. So another question on the chat that I see is uh, a request to categorize the type of defect that can be prevented. Uh, so I'm not sure if I understand the question fully. Uh, we're not really preventing uh, those bugs from happening. We just make sure that the, an attacker would not be able to exploit a use after free to execute arbitrary code in the browser process because they wouldn't be able to inject attacker control data into the memory space where the dangling pointer points to. Right? So the bug is still there. It still might need to be fixed after being detected somehow. Uh, we're just making sure that the security vulnerability is not there. Right. So, so as Bartek said, we don't need to rush uh, and merge uh, fixes. But and also our users are protected this way. Uh, and I see another uh, point about uh, a similar approach that was employed in Edge. So the, the scanning approach, the star scan approach, that's mostly inspired by a recent, re recent Mark Us uh, academic paper. And we also aware that uh, Internet Explorer uh, had a, a technique they called MemGC, which is a little bit similar. Uh, it was a little bit more narrowly, narrowly scoped uh, yes, so we're building on top of shoulders of other uh, giants. Any other questions? Okay, so I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much for attending, and I hope that 
we're gonna be able to discuss the the project going forward. We're gonna try to hang out in the breakout breakout room number one on Slack if there are any additional questions. Uh, thank you.